well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? It almost feels weird even coming in off that music. You know what I mean? Yeah, it does. It's like, like we should wait for it to wind down uh-huh. or something. I don't breathe. Maybe, maybe you've done a piano dub. Uh, my name is Eric, and uh, and you're Michael. I am Michael, and we got a double feature today. We mm-hmm. got a, a single word movie. Yeah, the double order dilemma yeah. feature. I'm calling it failed utopia double feature. Today. <laughs> failed utopia is fine. That's a fine theme. Um, here's the okay. So here's the order dilemma, right? Uh huh. This is uh break out your bag cat. It's time for another exciting episode of double feature. Yep. Episode. Right. And uh, and so here's the thing. We didn't use the bag cat today. We didn't. This is. Uh, I'm going to try and be a little bit more excited. We but this feared is one for of the bag cat. Yeah. Well, we came up with this great device, doublefeatureshow.com forward slash bag cat. It's a, it's, a, it's a stupid fucking cat popping out of a bag. It's not even in English. <laughs> not that it matters. The cat doesn't even talk. But uh, here's, I, I, we've been thwarted, man. I, mean, I, I don't know if we've been thwarted. I think our fear of being thwarted prevented us from letting it happen. We created a great weapon, and it is, it's not useful here. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Well, I, I was just, af- we were both afraid that watching Bad Cat would just seem really sad. Well, so every um, so we're gonna do Ravenous and Jonestown. Uh-huh. We're gonna spoil them. Jonestown's a documentary, and Ravenous is really hip. You should see it and use the chapters. If you haven't seen it, skip to Jonestown, and hopefully, uh, I'll sound happier than this. Here's what happens every time. We're gonna take a, a couple minutes to bullshit here. Sure. All right. So bullshit bag cat diatribe. Use the use the chapters. Skip over to the. I don't. I don't give a shit. It's our show. We're just gonna talk about it a little bit. It's important. So we cover these movies. Everybody mm-hmm. knows about Bad Cat right now because it's probably the best thing we've ever created. Second most visited page, third most. Right, something like that. And it's not even our video. It's some other guy. Right. It doesn't matter. So you watch some movies. They're rough. You have a bad time. You feel, you feel sad. You don't want to come on our show and feel sad. Right. We're like friends here. We're humanity. Yep. People come. They should hang out with us. It's all fine. We love Every goddamn person who listens to this show, even the people who write us mean letters. Yeah. Love them all. Especially those. Love people. Hate ideas. Love people, right? That was That the sounds thing. about right. All right. So, uh, Bad Cat. So, getting back to Bad Cat. So, we're pairing these movies up, and uh, every, every year we seem to have this dilemma since the, at least the second year. Uh-huh. Where, um, you know, we'll get like halfway through the year, and all of a sudden the hard stuff starts coming. Yeah. We start putting these movies on, you know, movies that you don't watch often enough because, you know, they're kind of like a, right. a punch to the gut. It started with Martyrs. I mean, that's a yeah, sure. textbook example of well, when to martyrs, bust out the but cat. I mean, right. There's, but I mean, you know, there's, there's been a bunch of them. Oh, sure. And every time we talk about Bad Cat, we seem to bring them all up. Um, even, even as far back as Hostel, I guess. Mm-hmm. Hostel was more just weird feelings. Yeah. Um, but also just this... This fucking profound moment in cinema that I didn't know things movies could do, right? Mm-hmm. And so our hope is we've we fixed this. We no longer have a movie that disturbs us so much we can't record a show. Because we have a, a dumb little cat that pops right. his stupid head out of a bag. Mm-hmm. And up, oh, what's he going to do? His head's in the bag and then it comes out of the bag. <laughs> Here's the thing, right? So we don't have to worry about order. We don't have to worry about the fun one goes second or whatever. Right. Get us out of the mood. Sure. Because we just look at the dumb little cat. And then we should all feel better. Right. Everybody should feel, the people who listen should feel better. We should feel better. We should come on here. We should just all have a great time. It should be a goddamn party. So we put Revenus first uh-huh. and just watch it first, whatever. Watch it. Say, I, it doesn't matter. Yep. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it, I mean, by comparison, it's the fun one because yeah. at this point, every film we've ever done with the exception of maybe a small handful will be uh, by comparison, the fun one right. uh, next to Jonestown. So that makes Ravenous the fun one, right? right. Which is even <laughs> funnier because it's not. Uh, but we're going to put it first, and then we're going to talk about Jonestown. Now, normally we would use the Bad Cat at the end. Sure. We would, you and I, would watch Bad Cat, and then we'd come record the show. Everything mm-hmm. would be fine. We just finished watching Jonestown right. a couple minutes ago. And um, uh, my fear is I'm imagining Bad Cat, but with the piano score from the end of Jonestown. Right. 
Bad Cat would it would destroy Bad Cat. It would. We would never be able to use it again. Mm-hmm. It would crush it. Bad Cat would become instantly the saddest fucking thing you've ever seen. Which I mean, it's not fair. That's not something right. that you can't. You cannot taint the Bad Cat. It That's needs true. to be pure and beautiful at all times. And stupid. It needs to remain stupid. It, because yeah, the well, second above it, stops, all things. it stops becoming stupid, it be, everything It needs is to remain mindless and disassociated. Yeah, right. Otherwise, there's no constant in the universe. So I'm, I'm really sad, and we're going to start with Ravenous, and we'll, you know what, we'll come back to this. All right. So yeah, I mean, you mentioned that Ravenous is, uh, you said, by comparison, the fun one, and that is really the only way to put it, because sure, sure. Ravenous, watching Ravenous is like being punched in the face Right. Over right. and over again. And right when you think you're ready to get punched in the face again, it punches you in the gut. Right. And then punches you in the face. Yeah, right back there. The thing about Ravenous that is ridiculously hard to get a handle on is this score. Mm-hmm. Okay. One of the most standout things for Ravenous is this score. And it's done by Damon Albarn, who I know that you and I are both big fans of. We talked about on the, I believe, the Tank Girl and Schindler's List episode. Right. Because along with the artist from the uh, Tank Girl comic, mm-hmm. uh, Damon Albarn is uh, part of Gorillas. Sure, and um, the he good was from Bad Blur and the Queen, in the '90s. And, yeah, lots of lots of bands. Yeah, um, he did this great Gary Newman cover. I'm sure I mentioned. Uh, uh-huh. We have a technical, just uh, all around great guy. Yeah, and, and uh, you asked me something kind of interesting. Yeah, after uh, the movie, did you want to kind of talk about that a little well, bit? I mean, I'll I'll just ask you on the air, I guess. Sure. Uh, we're watching the film, and it's obvious if you've seen Ravenous that there are certainly moments where the score is going to make you feel strange and right. certainly uncomfortable. Right. The two points that I think are particularly stand out for this yeah. is the chicken run mm-hmm. when Ives is still Calhoun. Right. And he tells uh, the one character to run, and then sure. immediately Banjo sure. chasing the chicken score, which is very weird because right before that, we get what is probably in my top 10 creepiest moments in a film, sure, yeah. which is Calhoun breathing and digging funny. Yeah. yeah and then, you have no idea what's going right. on. Can we study that moment for just a second? Here? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, what the hell? I yeah. Mean. It is one of the strangest. And the thing is, is it? it's one of the weirdest turns in the film. Right. But the film is packed with stuff like that. It really is. It really is. Uh, I mean, you know, they're in a cave and yeah. he's outside and he starts digging. Yeah. It almost seems like there's some camera thing right. going on. And but he's it's, breathing he's just, rhythmically and pointing his fingers like he's almost yeah. dancing. You don't know what he's pointing at. Right. They give you kind of the illusion that he's standing right against one of the characters. Right. He's right in the guy's face. Uh, but it doesn't really, when the camera pulls back, it doesn't appear that he's anywhere yeah. near him and he's digging and you don't know why he's di- like, what the fuck is he doing there? Yeah. Uh, and then the score getting back to the right. score. And then right after, uh, shortly after, uh, Boyd gets out of the pit and everything, he's walking back home to the encampment, to the fort mm-hmm. and the score thing from the intro to the film plays except it's done with all synthesizers right and it sounds like happy i'm coming home music sure sure but you've just been through one of the most upsetting tumults yeah. in this forest right because it's not just everybody being slaughtered and it turns out this dude is a psychotic cannibal but also boyd jumps off a cliff lands on a dying soldier and then ends up having to eat him yeah in order to survive yeah right yeah, it's uh, it's certainly a dark time in the film. Right. And it doesn't feel that way because right. of the music. And so I asked you right about this point, maybe a little later, I said, if you didn't know that Damon Albarn was doing the score, would you feel like the score was making mistakes? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, and it's hard for me to answer honestly. Right. Probably. I, yeah. I, I think yes is yeah, the answer. I think so too. I feel like when something happens... I immediately think, whoa, score, wait, you're, you're being a little bit, you're taking too much liberty there. Right. And then I think, well, but Damon Albarn knows what he's doing. Yeah, this is, this is a celebrity takedown, right? Right. This is gorillas. This is, uh, I mean, this is some smart stuff here. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I surrender to it and I say, well, Damon knows what he's doing and I yeah. don't. And I start to read into it in ways that, I mean, it's also just possible he wrote this in about three hours and never yeah. saw the movie, and it just kind of got edited in there by right. someone who had no idea. I mean, these mistakes along the way could could be what that's attributed to. Sure. But 
You know, in um, I, I feel like I'm already doing Revenus a huge disservice because I feel so affected by Jonestown. Uh-huh. So, it, I mean, it really should be half of the awesome today. Yeah. And so I'm going to give it an extra boost of awesome and say that this was a bunch of incredible decisions by everyone along the way. Isn't that it? the score uh, going in place. I, I has yeah. to be it. I feel like so much of Ravenous does so many things that normal films just don't do. Well, let's break down. I mean, here's what this is doing, sure. right? As far as the music goes. Yeah. Whether it's intentional or not, mm-hmm. we'll assume it's intentional because uh, awesome filmmakers, right? Right. So uh, we're getting in the in the scene you described alone right. in just that scene. You know, you have the terror music. You're going through fucking caves, and then all of a sudden you're out of caves, and you're getting the fun time music. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's even worse than continuing the terror music. It's almost as if to say, "Aren't you having fun with this? Right? Aren't you just having a swell time?" And you start to think back to the other moments with fun music as if something might have been wrong there and you right. just had no idea. Sure. As if everybody was having, it's, uh, it's like a moment from 2001 Maniacs. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about, uh, right. about that way back then. We're all having parties and we're all, you know, eating pies and stuff. And then we all look around at each other and go, wait, were those pies made of humans? Was that, right. was that human exactly. meat? We were all just having a good time with human meat. The whole film kind of, by the end of it, instead of... It seeming to take a path where it gets more fucked up. Mm -hmm. Instead, the way that the film is executed and the way that it's paced and the way that certain things are revealed, it turns out to seem more like the film is revealing how fucked up it's been from the beginning. Right, right. Eating people only becomes more normal. Right. The most disturbing scene in the whole fucking movie, for me is the first scene where they're all eating steaks. Yeah. And I don't know why I'm so messed up about it. But I absolutely am. And yeah. that scene gets worse as time goes yeah. on. Uh, but the whole I'm going to eat people. By mm-hmm. the end, I'm just like, save yourself. Eat that dude. Yeah. No problem here. I don't even mind. And it just keeps twisting itself. When Ives comes back to the uh-huh. camp after, you know, when he comes back and he's the new head officer. Right. Because Hart has supposedly been killed. You get this moment where Boyd sees Ives and just falls the fuck down Mm -hmm. and that's what your brain does right your brain just shuts off for a second what the fuck and then you spend the next maybe 10 15 minutes correct me if i'm wrong because this was the first time you saw this film sure this is all you wouldn't tell me by the way anything i didn't want to i didn't know anything about the pair i uh i i went in completely cold on this yeah and so for the next 10 to 15 minutes you're trying to figure out if robert carlisle plays a dual role you're not sure if he's Calhoun coming back well, shaved. Well, he doesn't have any bruises. Right. He doesn't have any bruises. He doesn't have any gunshot wounds. Sure. He's completely unscathed. And even though you've been told of the Wendigo myth yeah. and how people are revitalized, still in your brain, you're thinking that that can't be a full explanation. Sure. There's something else going on here. Right. And immediately the film backs up and says look all these people are dying and ives is sitting in his room right it right. couldn't have been ives yeah you don't really even want to suspect a third party right and until you have to yeah. until really until the film tells you there's a third party and here's who it is yep and you just think what the hell jeffrey jones yeah uh also what the hell jeffrey jones <laughs> right that note. this is uh, you were saying and it's totally true this is probably his longest most involved role in any He's, film. Yeah, I mean, and aside I, from maybe Ferris Bueller. Well, I thought when he died, I wouldn't even say that. Okay. I would say this even, sure. even beats out Ferris Bueller. Uh, so, I mean, you have to tell me a little bit here. Where did this movie come from? Who are these? Uh, the the list of actors that are in it. This. Yeah. I don't understand how this isn't a movie everybody knows about, especially know. given the people in the it. casting and everything. I had no idea about this film. If 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 I may, I can tell you how I discovered this film. And unreliable might... Auburn is that <laughs> unreliable Auburn is that that's, that's how like, I learned. It's like unreliable narrator, it's, but yeah, we'll but... never get to use this again. But that would be beautiful when your music is. I don't know misleading. misleading is that yeah. yeah when your music thinks the film is going somewhere it's not unreliable Auburn. well we'll try we'll try and just <laughs> force it upon some other poor film but uh, is that how no actually okay. it's it's kind of strange it's almost as strange as the film i don't believe you somebody tried to add me on this social networking site right 
and I wasn't familiar with them. And I had assumed, as I often do when I don't know people personally, sure. that it's a double feature fan. Right. Totally okay with it. Happy to add double feature I fans. I automatically add people I don't know and put them in a group called Double right. Feature. So, yeah. so I... We're on the Facebook, I, by the way, if you want to add us, go ahead and do that. Um, so I go to this guy's page and I scroll down to movies, which uh-huh. is what I do when I try to determine if it's a double feature fan. Interesting. Because if it's a double feature fan, there's about 90 films and I've only heard of four or five. Yeah. This guy had one film. Really? And it was this film called Ravenous. Interesting. And then listed under his interests was just the word Ravenous. Did you get viral added? Is that what I don't know, but... Did this film This film came out in 1998. (laughs) I know. I know. Wow. So I went to the Wikipedia page Uh and saw Robert Carlyle, Jeremy Davies, Jeffrey Jones, and immediately get my hands on this fucking film and watch it, and I'm simultaneously full of adoration and utter fear and disgust with what's going on. Sure. Because I'm thinking this is one of the most ambitious and frightening things I've ever seen done. And it's more frightening that I've never heard about it. It makes me feel like this is being done to just me. Yeah. It feels like a big, scary secret. Yeah. And these guys are actually doing these horrible things. Yeah. I almost feel like this was uh, assembled via YouTube. Right. From clips of other movies I've never seen. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have these huge names. But then you have, and I mean, excuse me here a little bit, Ravenous. I know you were from the late 90s. You have these shit titles. Yeah. You have these terrible fucking titles. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the camera work is a little cheap looking. I mean, I want to give them artistic credit. Yeah. Because maybe they didn't have budgetary credit. Sure. But a, a scene, especially like the one where, you know, where he's forced to jump off the cliff. Right. The cinematography, the uh, the composition of those shots what is shot and where and the editing between it Uh is all spectacular. It is all really fantastic. You feel every tiny bump of that fucking hill. It's, I mean, it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's, it's great. And, uh, and at the same time I'm watching it and there's this strange music. Right. So you're always on this level of genius or insanity with how this film is being thrown together. And, uh, combined with the fact that no one seems to know what it is. You're right. It feels like a secret joke. But this is something out of the game. You yeah, know, this is, exactly. Uh, uh, you're almost afraid to watch it. Right. At the end, you find out that you are ravenous. You yep. know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's, uh, it's terrifying. Yeah. And so, you know, you have this cast, too. And then the cast just fucking dies in yeah, the middle of the film. Yeah, they all die all at once. Or kind of in the beginning of the film, right. end of the first act. You uh-huh. just kill the entire cast well, of all these people. Well, it seems like the end of the film. It does. Because yeah. you don't know... You can't imagine where the film will go after it kills all the sure. characters off. Wow, thanks, Michael. What an interesting independent short you've brought mm-hmm. today on Double Feature. And right. then it goes on for another hour. Well, it turns into this weird story where this lead cannibal is trying to form a cannibalistic society and feed on gold rushers. Sure. And it's all really kind of fucked up because what you start realizing about Ives and a little bit about Hart, but mostly Ives. Mm hmm is that he really likes eating people. Yeah. He likes everything about it. Sure. He thinks it's funny. He thinks it's silly that other people get eaten. He likes to make puns about how he's going to eat people. Oh, especially on his own deathbed. Right. You can't even believe it. He just loves everything about it. He is living the cannibal dream. Really good example, when the uh, team is coming back Mm -hmm. uh, from that expedition... Not the first time, but the second time when uh, the woman goes out to fetch the general. Right. And he looks out with his telescope and says, breakfast, lunch, reinforcements. Right. And you just get this. It's almost like the score is his brain. Yeah. And he's just kind of having a jolly time. Oh, I'm a cannibal. Nobody can stop me. This is fun. Right. And then you get this horrific moment at the end with the bear trap. Also, just going to point this out kind of obviously symbolic right bear trap sure. eating the two cannibals sure um looks like it, i mean it looks like fake chattering teeth from peewee's playhouse not sure where they got a bear trap that big right not sure why it's armed <laughs> sitting in there also not completely sure why you would set it off 
if the top jaws just latch into you. Right. But I mean, I guess there's pressure that the yeah. the bear trap creates and it's going to dig some of those spikes sure. in underneath when the, the clamps right. close. And it's very sneaky. I'll, I'll buy it. Yeah, it's very sneaky, right? I mean, <laughs> wait, this is just a big fucking game. And it finally gets to this moment where Boyd has to make the decision of whether he's going to give in, acquiesce. As there, That's a great conversation. Yeah, I love right. the acquiesce conversation. Right. Well, that's why the fucking trap is there. Right. If you want to ask why is there a bear trap set in there, uh-huh. it's set by the writers. That's exactly why yeah. it's there. It's so he has to make a decision. And we have Ives die and this moment where Boyd looks like he needs to live. Yeah. And then he just slowly lays down and falls asleep. And the score swells in this weird, wasn't that a fun story yeah, right. way? All right, kids, go to bed. Right. It's just this most, it's the most bizarre, fucked up bedtime story with a happy ending. It's almost like a happy ending because it shows this shot, right, of the two of them cuddling yeah, right. in a bear trap. Right. <laughs> the one guy who's finally met his match who will take him down. But not eat him. Right, but, not I mean, eat him. He, he defeats him in the end. But that's of. not the end of the cannibals because the general wantonly eats people stew. Yeah, right. And the cycle can then continue from there. They've contaminated the water. It's right. going to get into the school system. Right, exactly. Oh, God. But, I, I mean, I cannot say enough how much I love this film just for being so fucking weird, but still telling a story that I've never heard before. I mean, the fact that it's in the 1840s. Yeah. That doesn't right. happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> let's just make it in the 1840s, too. Yeah. Well, also, uh, uh, congratulations to you for... Um, uh, finding Antonia Bird, who I believe directs films and has girl parts. Holy crap. I I think those are both, I'm almost positive those are both true. Huh. And uh, I don't know anything about the director. I just can't bring my director a game today. But uh, you've, you've added plus one to the, really the quota, the metrics that have now been set for double feature female directors. Great. You have chaptered over to Jonestown, where everything is... <laughs> Happy and a good time. I really don't want to start crying on the show. Just hold it down, brother. Holy crap. Um, so, Jonestown, mm-hmm. The Life and Death of People's Temple is the uh, the full title of the movie. And it's directed, it was a 2006 documentary by Stanley Nelson. So, bravo Stanley Nelson and bravo everybody involved sure. in, the, in the goddamn thing. Bravo the goddamn guts of the people who were part of the temple oh, I know. that showed up and Thank you, because I wouldn't have even gave a talk. Yeah. Uh, the, the ability of those people, even you know, even uh, all the way forward in time sure. here, to still talk about those events and to be able to keep themselves collected. Right. I mean, uh, I to amazing. give some sort of insight outside of screaming, this was horrible. Why sure. would you ever want to talk about right. this? It reminds me of people coming back from the war that don't want to talk about the war. Yeah. You know, that's the that really that's the right thing. That's the justified thing as far as what we should expect. Of yeah. Those people. We should expect them to say nothing because they have been through some of the most traumatic experiences a human being can endure well and i think that's only juxtaposed against how much joy they probably felt at times too yeah i know that makes it so much worse oh it really does i mean i i guess we should talk about that uh that side yeah, of i things. think that's probably everybody knows the sad stuff absolutely they do um you know we talked about this i can't even remember the episode of the show but we said hey jonestown that's a thing we should probably discuss. We should find a documentary. And Jesus fuck, did we find a documentary? <laughs> I just looked up the first Jonestown documentary. Uh-huh. I got it off Netflix. I watched it. And this, this fucking happened. Yeah. Uh, and then I thought, hey, I should make Michael watch Thanks for this that. as well. You got me back um, for Martyrs. I'll give you that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we start with another black screen with white text. Mm-hmm. We're learning about some people. We're learning about the, uh, the time, the events that mm-hmm. were taking place. And I mean, this is, even trauma aside, an incredible story. Yeah. Made more so incredible by how it ends. Sure. But an incredible story. We have Jim Jones, Uh who is the fucking Elvis of this story, right? Yeah. The Jesus of the story. Everything is at his command, and it's just, I mean, the arc of Jim Jones right. from the beginning to the end of this is mind boggling. You know, sometimes people say crazy things, uh, you know, something has to be real because 
you couldn't make you couldn't shit make like something this up. like this up. And rarely do I believe that as right. a fan of narrative fiction. Sure, but then I see something like Jim Jones, right? And you almost wouldn't even believe this story. It's uh, you know the thing that makes it unbelievable is not if I just told you a story. All right, this guy is not evil. Uh-huh. He's um, uh, he does some evil fucking things, but he's a human character. He starts out doing great stuff, sure, and by the end, he's fucking slaughtering people. That's not that unbelievable right. a story. But when you see the enthusiasm, even kind of speaking about him today, right? These people seem full of. I, I mean, it's they a respect really love for at guy. least a part of Jim Jones. Yeah, absolutely. They never lose the fact that when he got started and when. The People's Temple was in its roots before it moved to South America. Right. There was a really wonderful, fantastic thing yeah. that was going on there. They never lose sight of that, despite what could only be described as the worst possible outcome yeah. for the People's it, Temple. It really is. Yeah. I mean, short of world destruction, mm-hmm. this is about the worst fucking thing that could have happened. I guess the, uh, you know, the, what, 90 people or whatever that weren't there that day right. could have been there. Sure. That's really the only way it could have been any worse. Yeah. And uh, in some ways, not to shortchange, you know, human life, but the fact that people made it out, it makes it more tragic for the rest of us knowing that story. Sure. This could have been uh, a, a story we never got details Waco. about. Yeah, right. Uh, Waco, where we get very few survivor tales. We get very few audio recordings from inside. The thing that's incredible about the Jonestown story to me is that I knew so little about it before having seen this. You knew the Kool-Aid. Yeah. I mean, there's no, uh, I've never really come across a documentary about this. It seems like there should be 30 documentaries about this. Right. Absolutely. Especially given how much, you know, they recovered. Sure. uh, Well, given the the fact that Jim Jones' own son is willing to discuss it. Yeah. I think that's a documentary in and of itself. Yeah, it certainly is. It's uh, it's really incredible. It really is. Um, I mean, so you have this guy, all right? So he's definitely a real character, although what he ends up doing is uh, fucking despicable and mm-hmm. evil in, in the highest regard. But he starts by breaking down racial barriers. Right. He starts by building a community, uh-huh. something that he's enthusiastic for and it may be part of the narrative of the documentary. Right. But those anecdotes are at least there. It seems like in the beginning, he is a pure and upstanding... He's not only a pure and upstanding guy, he's a guy that seems like double feature would get along just fine with. Yeah, well, I mean, aside... For somebody I, who has their own church, I guess, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. There's there's a few things he does that are not so good. Uh, one being fake miracles. But yeah. that's almost completely overshadowed. I'm never willing to overlook no. something completely. No, never. But it is certainly overshadowed by the fact that he worked out a working socialist community. Right. Which, be it as it may, our own, you know, ideas of socialism, the fact that he got it to work and that people were taken care of. Right. That is important. Yeah. People taking care of other people. That's the important oh, thing sure. from that community. And also the whole eventually gives up no heaven. We have to actually do shit instead of sure. pray to Sky Man to send us apples. I believe you mean Sky Pig. Sky Pig. Um, your imaginary Sky Pig. Yeah, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like uh, obviously there's nothing libertarian about socialism. Right. But there is something kind of libertarian about a small section of people within, sure, uh, let's say, a free United States who decide they want to embark on a socialist experiment. Right. They want to operate on a socialistic level. That's purely within their rights. Right. It's something myself as a libertarian I would not join into. Right, but nobody's asking you to. Exactly. No one by force is taking your money and making you do this. Although I guess there's some coercion really sure. in, in the manipulation Right, there. there's fear and sleepiness, both of which I know are very good tactics at getting people to do something. Especially the latter. Yeah, that's definitely true. And when we start to look at how this happened, I think that's one of our, our keystones in that. But uh, all right, so breaking down racial barriers, that's a big thing. I mean, uh, it, it's surprising really even hearing that, how how human this guy is. That integration and uh, the bus tour that he's talking about, mm-hmm. uh, this thing where they're carting these buses around, and then the senior homes. The guy's building right. fucking senior homes. Now, granted... In doing it, he's also taking all of the the proceeds 
uh, from seniors selling their actual homes. Right. You know, but he's using that money to create senior communities. Sure. And to take care of them if they need to go to the hospital or if they need a dentist appointment. It's a full ride. It's almost like an end of your life scholarship. Yeah, that's how it seemed to me, too. These people are nearing the end of their lives. Jim Jones is befriending a bunch of old ladies, so when they die, he will get all their money. Right. And that starts to make him an asshole, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't think it's really until he's dressing up his secretary as a poor, crippled old woman Mm -hmm. that I'm really feeling, all right, scumbag. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's some Peter Popoff shit. That's some uh, James Randi kicks Peter Popoff's ass uh, kind of stuff. And, you know, we've talked that to death, but look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. This is where we enter into that uh, that great thing, you know I hate. You want to just give me the phrase? I know you know what's going on in my, my brain right now. Uh, I believe uh, the phrase is, the end justifies the means. Yeah, absolutely. We have an end outcome here. Doesn't matter how many people we're lying to or deceiving sure. in the meantime. The point is, they will find Jim Jones <laughs> or Christ or my charity or whatever stupid thing people are trying to trying to do. It's never okay to lie to people. I take a really hard stance on that. Uh, You can get into minutia with little white lies Mm -hmm. and what if it blah, blah, don't care. When in question, don't fucking lie. Yeah, right. That's that's exactly where I come down. You know, but then he's fucking launching the Bible across the church. Which is kind of awesome. uh, This black book has oppressed black people. There is no heaven. Let's make heaven here. I mean... You know, I'm I'm already starting to forget about lying to fucking everyone. Right. Lying to everyone. Well, and there's also the other thing that I personally thought was really cool, where the People's Temple was just willing to show up and fight for your cause. Right. You would call them, they would show up in droves sure, sure. with picket signs and support you. Yeah. I mean, that was the fucking 70s, right? Yeah, That's the 60s, incredible. the 70s. That was... The movement, people could change the world. People could at least change the nation. But they stopped sleeping and they stopped thinking for themselves. Sure, and Jim Jones ended up with some more political power as if he weren't already monopolizing. Yeah, taking advantage of these people. Sure. Taking over their lives and really using them as his his workers, his his minions almost. Right. So the movie shows his Kool-Aid fake out Mm -hmm. uh, where he tells everybody they just drank poison. Right. Kind of get a reaction out of that. And that's the first time uh, the film invokes that. And you, it, it's right about the right time because you're thinking, Jim Jones, what a great guy. Mm-hmm. And then you're thinking, man, if he poisoned everybody, that would be kind of shitty, wouldn't it? Yeah. And then he starts taking advantage of people sexually. Mm-hmm. And nobody is on his side at that point. Well, that's, he gets into the, that weird, everybody's homosexual except me, but he's right, clearly right. repressing something. Well, that's when you start feeling the Waco vibes. Right. Right. Exactly. I'm exempt from all the rules. Everyone is my sexual servant. Mm-hmm. And seeing, you know, seeing one of the victims talk about how, you know, everybody was, all the men were saying, oh, yeah, I'll sleep with Jim Jones or I slept with Jim Jones. And he's just thinking, man, I love my wife. Right. I, you know, that guy is just uh, great. I mean, everybody's great in this, yeah. but I never forget that, uh, that little section of the interview because he has so much. I mean, it's so absurd to him, it's laughable. Right. Until it becomes blisteringly tragic later on. Right. And then there's the woman who wrote the book as well, talking um, talking about, you know, being invited back or I guess told to go to sure. the back of his bus or whatever. It's, it's, I mean, if ever there were, if ever there were a time to use the oxymoron consensual rape. Yeah, sure. It's, I mean, it's there. It's yeah. when power is exercised and you don't feel comfortable saying no. Well, yeah, I mean, she, uh, you know, she's under complete control. This is the man who effectively runs her their, world. Uh, yeah, right. So where it really gets dangerous, if it isn't dangerous by this point, is where they have this separation uh, from Jonestown and the rest of the U- right. United States. Sure. And they start talking about when people eventually come to Jonestown, they're being reunited with their families. Mm-hmm. You know, so they have this uh, this separation. And, you know, it's an exclusive society. No one can leave. People start turning each other in. It reminds me right. of Scientology. Yeah. You know, well, when, it's it's a combination of Scientology, 1984, and Equilibrium. Yeah, I think that describes it perfectly. I mean, once you're in, you are afraid to leave. Sure. Uh, if you talk about leaving, you get turned in. 
um, it becomes prison there and you have to convince yourself it's not prison. Mm -hmm. You're not even allowed to, to talk about it as if it is prison. That's not a free society. Well, and there's this glint of promise that happens where they talk about when Jim Jones isn't there and how it's lighter and there's music and it seems like it's just a more fun, happy place. And it makes me, I don't know if it makes you or anybody else, but me, it made me think, would this have worked if at this moment Jim Jones were assassinated, if he gave up, if he sure, left, if he sure. vanished? Would Jonestown have progressed into an actual flourishing utopian society? That's a pretty amazing question, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's the, the sort of thing you could spend a lot of time talking about right. and speculating on. It's shocking that one man has the control to turn a sure. potentially perfect society into 1,000 corpses. We don't really have a good point of comparison. No, for that. Uh, we have it's all a, speculation. We have a couple. You, there's things like, are you aware of the Free State Project? You ever heard of that? Um, so it's all these people who move to. I want to say it's Vermont or something. Uh-huh. I don't. I don't know enough about it. But uh, it's a bunch of uh, fucking crazy freedom fighter, you know, and and like more power to them. Sure, I don't mean to to knock that stuff. But they decided, all right, we are into extreme freedoms on all fronts. We should all just move somewhere so we have more power. We can exercise that a little bit more. So they just picked a state. I don't know if it was already the the fucking freest state or whatever mm-hmm. they decided to live in. But they do these kind of, uh, you know, civil disobedience and these uh, these political things. It's a it's almost a complete place of activism. Cool. And they can exercise these, you know, crazy experiments Mm -hmm. as far as well what if we used fucking liberty dollars right or right i don't know they've kind of created their own society under the larger united states society and so we have little uh kind of projects like that that spring up here and there but as far i mean i i'm amazed that these guys were able to build their own city sure. in a place where there was not a city before build they and came. support. Yeah. I mean, they had food for the entire populace. And, you know, the period when he's gone, eventually that ends. Right. I mean, once the, the fucking crazy spills out, you have these Andrew Ryan style messages right. playing over the overhead. Right. Andrew Ryan, not Senator Ryan, who's in right. the movie. Two different. Um, but just 24-7 propaganda. Uh, just a constant stream of, uh, honestly, a constant stream of lies. Sure. It's not even just... It's insulation. Yeah, it's a way to to remain in control, even when even when you yourself have to sleep. Right. So you start to get this maddening voice that's just talking to you at, at all times. And then we get to this point in the documentary where, and, and tell me if this struck you or not, mm-hmm. when we're talking about Senator Ryan. Right. This is the point when I saw it the first time that I start thinking... You know, uh oh, we're getting to a point where there's people we're talking about in the documentary who are not being interviewed in right, the documentary. Right. How long are we talking about Ryan as the hero of the story before you go, we're not gonna interview Ryan, are we? I actually never I never considered that because oh, really? I assumed he was, you know, he looked a little bit older in the video okay, footage. Sure. That maybe could be he it. Yeah, definitely. Didn't live maybe he had a heart attack maybe he also just didn't want to participate sure i mean there's all kinds of uh, with politics and and especially something as delicate as jonestown sure i was trying really hard not to speculate as to why this person wasn't being interviewed oh yeah absolutely yeah i mean the movie makes it seem like you can just get anybody to talk about it because of the impossible you know interviews right that they really get i think it came down to just disgust, fear, and I think a perpetuation of the truth. Yeah. Because they didn't want it to seem like a monstrous idea that yeah. was doomed from the start. Right. They wanted to tell a version of it that proved that at least they had the best of intentions and they weren't there to watch people die. So then this is it. This is where it gets hard. I mean, uh, they start going over the supplies. Right. And Jim Jones is showing them... Food, oh, here we have the Brian black Dotson. eyed peas, some rice. Oh, and over in this container, we have the Kool Aid. And so this time it feels a lot harder than yeah. last time. <laughs> last time it was just uh, a powdered beverage. Mm-hmm. This time it is a fucking poison. Even right. though it's not a poison yet, right? You know this is the same Kool Aid that will be going in these people's mouths. This will be ending their life. The the supplies he's casually you know going over here. Sure. And then it gets even fucking worse. You know you're seeing the party. They're throwing this great party and you're seeing all these people 
I mean, uh, alive, but fucking alive. You right. know what I mean? They're, Dancing, happy, singing. They are having the time of their life. Things could not be going better as far as the show that they're putting on. Right. This seems like uh, out of the happiest 70s movie we have ever seen. Everybody's having a blast. And to know that 24 hours later, mm -hmm. they will all be dead. All of them. And you're just looking at these people you're seeing them celebrate. You're seeing There's them the, smile. The woman singing right. and dancing. She's going to be dead. They're all going to be slaughtered. These are the real people. You're looking at right. footage of people who will all be dead. That's fucking hard. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the first moment where it really, like, it really hits me. And then there's the day that things fell apart. You know, they're talking about uh, the cameraman getting shot. That's another right. incredibly hard moment. You know, they show the video signal going out, whether mm -hmm. that's actually his camera or not. Sure, and the total, totally fucked up moment where the uh, the sound operator sh just he has a little toy plane and a little toy truck, and right. he just kind of oh, drives God. it around, and it's toys. And if it were any other, you know, goddamn show, bullshit did it a lot. The TV yeah. show where sure. they would have people make diagrams, and it looked dumb as shit. <laughs> All right, I hate that little truck. Yeah. I hate it so much. I know, man. Oh, God. It's, uh, it's show me on the doll where they touched you, right? Yeah, yes. But, I mean, that's even become a joke because of right. how I, you know, this, oh, God, it's tragic. And then, and I mean, the part that uh, it, I just, I, I can't get through. It's hard. Honestly, it's hard for me to even talk about it. Yeah. The, uh, they have this incredible audio, this once-in-a-lifetime you know, possibly greatest recording of audio ever, audio, uh, cannot believe this exists. That is just uh, these people desperately crying out as they're dying. Right. I mean, that's what we're listening and to. And Jim Jones talking about how they have to die faster. And when you get to Christine Miller, I yeah. mean, I literally have goosebumps right now just thinking about it. I fucking lose it. I cannot deal with it. That woman who is the single dissenting voice basically arguing with him saying you know we don't have to die here and she puts up a fight she is the last real struggle to save these right. 900 lives right and the crowd goes against her you know there's a, a some random man who basically says jim jones has given you uh this life he's given you you know your life up to this point uh -huh. and that's the last you you hear of her and the entire time they're going over these uh uh, they're going one by one through the people who are interviewed, talking about the final days, right. talking about their relatives who are there. And there is this constant audio under everyone's story of just people crying out as they're dying yeah. for minutes, for what seems like days. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just the sounds of people dying against these stories, against uh, a man losing his wife and child, talking uh, very frankly about his baby foaming from the mouth. Right. You know, talking about their loved ones, and then you just see the bodies. You just see all of these people face down, lying there dead. And uh, a letter from an anonymous woman, you know, of the, the probably the final collective thoughts there. Sure. Thoughts better than I would ever be able to organize. Right. If I'm at Jonestown, mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm losing it, right? Yeah. I'm just a fucking baby. I'm useless. I am fearing for the end of my life mm -hmm. and someone sits down and collects their thoughts and writes about this experiment and basically says, you need to tell the world. And in any other documentary, this comes up and I think, fuck you documentary. Right. I see what you're doing here. You're doing that thing we made fun of on Schindler's List. Yeah. Where at the end they go, hey, Schindler's List, really glad somebody made this movie. Oh, yeah. Turns out I made it. And so the documentary is basically showing this letter that says someone needs to tell this story, but it is so good that it gets to do that. It's horrible and remarkable uh, simultaneously, and that's what makes it so bad. And good. We have a uh, website. Uh, fuck it. I don't care. What are we doing next time? Uh, next time we're going to, we're going to try to lighten the mood a little bit with a little one-handed score by a man named John Carpenter. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to do Assault on Precinct 13, uh, adding another uh, check to our immense John Carpenter library. That's we're seriously, with every, with every one we knock down, there's two more we discover right. as if they're coming out of a vault somewhere. <laughs>
And, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna hit another uh, double feature on the right side of the website favorite. Uh, that'd be Alfred Hitchcock with the wrong man. All right. So here's the deal, and uh, we'll talk about this this time. And next time you hear from us, it's gonna sound like there there was a great plan here. Uh huh. I'll take the blame for this, even though technically we should probably blame the producer, right? Okay. But I'm feeling very human today. I'm All just right. gonna completely Fair take the blame. We're phoning it in. Yeah. Now we're not going to phone it in on the episode. No, we're not going to phone in the show. We're the phoning in the will selection. Be great, right? Yep. But uh, all the double features have been making too much sense, mm-hmm. and we tried to just knock things off of the routine this week. Yep. And I uh, wanted to do John Carpenter. You wanted to do Alfred Hitchcock. They just need. It's been about six months, and we've only done one Hitchcock. Which I yep. said, you know, this year we're going to start nailing more Hitchcock stuff. We haven't done any John Carpenter in. I don't know. Five I love minutes. John Carpenter too much to let that happen. I know. So these are directors we need to talk about more of their movies. And and honestly, I just don't give enough of a good goddamn about uh, pairing things up with, woo, wacky theme. Great <laughs> great job with the uh, the two movies are linked by some arbitrary show. We're just going to talk about two good movies. I yep. hope they're good. They'll be good. Uh, they'll be great. What Watch- are the movies? We're going to do Assault on Precinct 13 and The Wrong Man. You were going to forget the fucking movies. I already said it. You? Did you? Yeah. I, I, all right. It's... Um, Watch more fucking film. Yeah, bye.